All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I put this uh, PowerPoint together for uh, specifically for this webinar tonight. Um, and I took uh, took some slides from other PowerPoints that I've done and created some others. And hopefully this will be a good uh, overview of what to expect for uh, you know, for taking the driver's proficiency level one. Now, the uh, as we go through the slides, this is the procedure that I uh, that I normally do. So, uh, when you go to the next slide, Deb, uh, what I like to start out with: uh, have your your horse, your carriage, and your harness already cleaned because we, we don't have time during the evaluation to go through the cleaning process. So we will you know, go over it quickly, but have everything clean and ready to go. And uh, if the horse is in a stall, I'll leave them in the stall and we'll go over and look at your cart first and uh, you know go over and do a safety inspection of that. You know, I'll ask you the parts of the wheel, uh, types of tires that could be on the wheel, types of hubs, uh, you know, how to check for soundness uh, of the condition of them and go over the, go over the, the parts of the, uh, of the cart. Uh, go to the next slide, Deb. Uh, oh, I, I messed up. This should be the third slide, but uh, while we while we're here, uh, you know, we'll also ask you about the spares that you should carry, and it doesn't have to be a, a fancy professional spares kit. But the important things, <coughs> excuse me, um, always carry a halter and lead for each horse, um, a hole punch, some. <coughs> Some, <coughs> excuse me, some rawhide string, a knife, uh, you know, hoof pick, an adjustable wrench, pliers, a hammer, a rain and trace splices, a hame strap if that's appropriate. And the important thing is make sure that the splices fit your harness because the, the splices that come in kits, sometimes they don't fit your particular uh, reins or or traces, so make sure that they're that the buckles are the appropriate size. Go ahead, go to the next one. Uh, that this this was uh, should be the second one. Uh, we'll go over the parts of the cart, uh, and uh, you know the seat, the the springs, the shafts. Uh, you know how it should be sized correctly for your horse or pony, um, uh, things like that. And, um, you know, we'll go over that and the uh, the uh, important parts of it, the, the safety aspects of it. Um, you can go to the next one. And we'll talk about balancing the cart. Um, and, uh, you know, the comfort of the horse is the most important factor. Uh, can you balance a cart without someone sitting in the seat? A lot of times you you go to an auction or pick up a cart and say, oh, this cart feels heavy. But as soon as somebody sits in the seat, now it becomes light in the shafts. So that's an important part of balancing the cart. Uh, where should the point of the shafts be? How does wheel size affect uh, the balance? Um, how do you check for rotted wood under the shaft leathers? Um, should your feet be able to rest firmly on the floor? And, you know, things like that. So the, the picture on the on the lower left, uh, unfortunately, it's a little hard to read. I don't know what it looks like on your screens, but yeah, it's all of those factors. The seat should be level, uh, the appropriate wheel size so that the shafts come correctly on the horse's body and things like that. And now they, this picture on the right, does that appear to be properly balanced? 
to me, it looks like the the loops could go down a little bit, one more hole, and I think it would be balanced because you see it's kind of going uphill. The seat's not level, and the cart is tilted backwards. And also, if the if the bridging straps were a little loose, the shafts could run up under the collar there. So these are all things that we have to be aware of. Next. And driving horses come in all different sizes. So that's why our vehicles come in all different sizes. You can go to the next one. And safety first. Uh, you know, we want to look at the uh, uh, at the at the shafts, the cross piece, the single tree, the uh, the clevis, the bolt that's holding it. Uh, if you the you know look at the parts of the wheel, check your springs or the shackles, things like that. Make sure all your bolts are are tight. Uh, nothing's missing. Uh, if you're driving a pair, same thing. Want to check all the moving parts and everything. Next. You know, in uh, in the the picture of the shafts, you see where it says clevis. Well, that bolt that holds the clevis and the single tree to the crossbar, that's a very important thing. If that were to fail or come out, you would you know, lose your connection to the to the cart. And uh, so you, you want to check all the all of those things. And um, if you're driving a pair uh, on the end of the pole, there could be two different ends. We don't have to worry about that for level one, but I just left these slides in, uh, the, the pictures in because I had this slide already. The lower left has got a crab and, a, and a, a hook for four in hand leader bars. And the other, the other one on the lower right, that's got a yoke uh, with single trees. Next. Then uh, after, we, after we go over the cart and determine that the cart and your spares and everything are safe and uh, ready to use, then we'll go over to the, to the stable area, uh, to the stall and uh, take the horse out, out of the stall. And I'll ask you about the grooming process and the tools that, uh, that you would use, the process that you would, that you would use when you take your horse out of the field uh, how you're going to clean them, what tools you're going to use. Um, and like I said, we don't have time to do it. So we go through this kind of quickly. Uh, I'll ask you a few questions about uh, the horse's hoof and shoeing, if he's got shoes on, why, it, why it's important to have, uh, you know, special shoeing if you're driving on, uh, on pavement so that the horses don't slip. Uh, the basic parts of the hoof, you don't have to be a farrier, but uh, just like this, uh, uh, you know, this will ask about the soul and the heel and the, and the frog and the purpose of, of them and the bulbs and, um, you know, things like that. But, you know, it, it's not, we don't spend a whole lot of time on this and you don't have to be uh, a farrier but we want you to know the, the basic things. And uh, also while we're looking at the hoof, you know, we ask about some diseases that would, that might happen to the, to the hoof and how to recognize them <coughs> and things like that. Uh, next. Then after, after that's done, then we start talking about the harness and, uh, uh, there's three main parts to the harness. The uh, draft part of the harness is the collar or breast collar, which the horse pushes against with its shoulders and the traces, which are attached to the cart. And that's what your connection is uh, to pull the cart. Uh, the steering part of the harness is the bridle, the bit and the reins. And the driving bridle is a specialized piece of equipment 
we'll go a little bit more into that into, in the next slide. And then the the check the neck and and uh, saddle turrets are rain guides to keep keep the reins in the proper place. And uh, and the shafts or the pole are attached to the carriage to steer it. And then the braking part of your harness is the, the saddle, the breeching, the back band, the crupper, uh, your hold back straps. Uh, and these parts all work together with the shafts of, or the pole to hold the carriage from running up on the horse when you're going downhill or slowing up. And every strap and buckle has a function of the overall mechanical mechanics of the of driving and the safe operation of the turnout. Go a little bit more into the driving bridle. The driving bridle is is different than a riding bridle. Um, some riding bridles use leverage, but driving bridles all use leverage. Uh, by the use of the bit and the uh, and the uh, the headpiece, the crown piece, and um, uh, the the nose band or the caveson, and it has to be adjusted to maintain comfort. And the blind the blinders keep the horse focused on the road ahead, and it's the main source of control other than your voice and your whip. <coughs> I'll ask you about uh, different types of bits. Uh, again, you don't have to be a, you know, a harness maker. Uh, starting from the uh, the upper left, we have, uh, you know, ask about different cheek pieces. Starting from the left, we have Liverpool cheeks there, then butterfly, uh, then an elbow or military bit. Uh, and then diff there's different kinds of mouthpieces. Again, from the left, we have a straight bar mouthpiece, a slight, uh, a slight port. Um, the uh, elbow bit has got the same type of mouthpiece. The uh, the other butterfly bit with the H, that's an arch mouth. Uh, then on the bottom, we have different kinds of snaffle bits. We have a double jointed snaffle or solid. Uh, snaffle and a single jointed snaffle, and then finally uh, on the the lower right is a Buxton bit, and um, so you know, so you want to be familiar with uh, you know a few different types of cheek pieces and mouth pieces that we use in driving, and um, you know how the reins affect. The, the leverage uh, in the using the different slots in the in the bits, and this is what the basic harness looks like. Uh, we have a you know a little bit of a draft style on the on the the paint, a light harness up in the upper left, and then just a a pleasure driving harness uh, lower. But they all have basically the same parts. Um, uh, now a lot of, some people call different parts of the harness, different names, and that's fine. As long as you know what the purpose of each part is, um, uh, you know, that, that, that's fine. And, uh, uh, looking at the, looking at the picture on the, on the left, we have the, the bridle and you got the blinker stays, the blinkers, uh, the head piece or the crown piece. The brow band, or uh, rosette, throat latch. I'll ask you how how that should be adjusted. <coughs> Excuse me, the cheek piece. Um, this picture has bearing reins on it. You don't have to worry about that. Nose band is is called the cavison. Um, they call it a face piece here. Other people call it a teardrop. Uh, you know, those are all fine. Uh, if you're driving with a breast collar, I'll ask you about the use of a collar and how to put it on. You don't have to name all the parts of the collar, but we'll discuss how it should fit on the horse, 
how it should be placed on the horse and uh, when it's appropriate to use a collar as opposed to a breast collar. And, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the Hames and that sort of thing. And then going to the picture on the right, uh, you know, we have the, the whole the whole harness there. And you see, you know, you might you call different names like uh, I call number number 10. They call it a false belly band. I call it the overgirth. Um, so either way is correct as long as you know what the purpose of it is, why we why we, we use it as, with a cart, why it's important. And, uh, you know, some people call the holdbacks uh, the bridging straps, and then they call the the bridging that goes around the butt. They call that the bridging or the uh, or the the seat of the bridging. So there's different names, but the purpose is the important thing. And again, some people say a loin a loin strap, or it could be called a hip strap. Uh, you know, so it, it, there's just a lot of different things like that. Uh, this, this is how uh, the, the lower picture uh, shows how the bridging should be used with going through the footman's loop. And then if the if the, the strap is long enough and you have to make loops, make the loops in front of the uh, in front of the footman loop and then come up uh, in this illustration. <coughs> The strap is underneath all three. Some people just put it underneath the last one because um, it comes out easier in an emergency if you have to. Uh, the important thing with doing that up is that you don't capture the trace when you make your loops. The trace has to be able to move freely in the big loop going up to the, uh, the bridging D. And uh, so, you know, here on, on this illustration on the right, you have some different names. So, like I said, there's different names for different parts of the harness, but the important thing is to know the purpose. And then, uh, you know, we'll, uh, the, the grooming process and cleaning your harness and cart or also inspection processes. So when you're cleaning your, your harness, you want to check, uh, you know, check all your billets and especially the folds and uh, your rain billets because saliva can make the, make the, the leather uh, brittle. Uh, so, uh, you know, th this is just an inspection process. And uh, these are just some of the some of the things to check. <coughs> then the next step we'll do once we go over all of those parts, <coughs> and uh, is put the harness on the horse. Put you know, and uh, you know, if the you know take the horse out of the stall, have an assistant, or put the horse on cross ties or tie it and uh, in a safe place. I like to put the breast collar or the full collar on first uh, because if you start at the front and work your way back, it, it makes more sense. And I was told many, many years ago when I first started learning to drive that um, in, in cold weather, you put the breast collar or the full collar on first and the horse's body temperature would get would get them up to, you know, the same temperature, and that's what they're going to be pushing against to drive. So, uh, I just always got in the habit of doing it that way. Um, then, if the traces are uh, are not attached, attach the traces to the breast collar or the collar. Then you place the saddle, the black backstrap and bridging on together all in one piece and attach the girth snug but not uh, 
not tight. Um, and if you have a false martingale, you have to put it through the girth first before you put it up. And <clears throat> just like putting a blanket on a horse, place the saddle forward of where of the final position where it's going to be and slide it back so that you're not pulling the hair uh, and standing it up uh, backwards. Buckle the crupper, adjust your back band. I, I always like to put the overgirth in the first hole uh, so that you won't forget it because if when it's when it's time to put two, uh, if you forget to readjust that overgirth and you get into the cart, at least if it's in the first hole, you have something that's going to keep the shafts from going all the way up. So I like to see, you know, do that. It's just a good habit to get into. Uh, put your put your reins through the turrets and uh, put them up so they're not on the ground and buckle the hand the handpiece together because when we drive, we always want the, the reins buckled together for safety. Um, and we'll talk more about during the evaluation uh, about putting the reins up. There are several different ways to do it. The important thing is that uh, whatever way you put them up, uh, if the horse were to move while you were, while you were putting them to, you want to be able to grab the rein and it undoes so that you have control of the horse and it doesn't make a knot on the back band and you're just pulling on the back band instead of the bit. Uh, then put the bridle on, adjust the nose band, curb chain and bit, attach your reins in the position that you drive in and um, then the horse is ready to be put to the carriage. And when you're done driving, you take everything off in the in the reverse order. Breaching fit is very important because uh, the, you know this is your the main part of your braking system. So we have three different uh, uh, the, the lower uh, the lower right is the properly adjusted bridging. Um, above that is bridging that's too low and too tight. And uh, the, other, the other one is bridging that's too high. And you can see things that can happen. If bridging this too high, if the horse drops his butt down, that bridging can run up onto the tail and frighten them. And you can have a bad situation. And if the bridging is too low, it could knock the horse's legs out from under them and it's uncomfortable and it's not going to work properly. So, um, and to adjust the, the bridging, uh, when, we, when we put the, uh, to the vehicle, we want the, the vehicle to be pushed back so that the traces are taut. Otherwise, we can't really adjust the bridging if the traces are too loose. So in other words, you have to push the cart back so that the traces are tight and then you can adjust your hold back or breaching straps correctly. Now it's time to put two. Um, after the horse is harnessed, go to a safe level place. Uh, and uh, with your with your assistant, stand the horse and bring the cart up up to the horse. Don't back them in between the shafts and bring the shafts up over its back so that you don't poke them. Uh, place the shafts in the tugs, attach both traces. And the reason for that is if the horse were to move and only one trace is attached, you're only half half attached and it could you know, be a be a problem. Uh, you know, don't attach one trace and then the and then the brit and then the holdback straps and the britching and then go to the other side because, like I said, if the horse moves, that can be a problem. Uh, once both traces are are uh, attached, uh, then you can adjust your holdbacks and the britching. <coughs> Tighten your overgirth. Take the reins and mount the carriage. 
have your assistants step away when you when you once you have control of the horse, then your passengers or assistant can mount the carriage, and then drive off at a at a at a walk. And of course, then we take out in the reverse order. <coughs> Once we're in the carriage, we're gonna, you know, go out on, you know, usually uh, if we're gonna be at Fair Hill, wherever we're gonna be doing the driving test, we'll have a short drive to that area. So that'll be our uh, simulated road course. And we'll make a left turn, a right turn, uh, stop somewhere. Uh, I wanna see you use, uh, either hand or whip single singles to uh, let people behind you know what you're doing. Um, the driving test for level one is just a simple test. There's no specific one, uh, but I wanna see you uh, drive the horse at the walk, the trot and the halt, um, change direction and have control of the horse uh, at all times. Uh, circles in both directions, change change of direction, and you can hold the reins at level one any way that you like. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, Achenbach or British Coachman or anything like that. If you're comfortable driving that way, that's fine. But if you've got one rein in each hand, that, that's okay too <coughs> for level one. And of course, you want to have your whip in your hand at all times when you're driving. Then we'll have a cones course set up. It'll be a simple cones course, maybe eight to 12 sets of cones with, again, changes of direction. Um, uh, if I remember right at Fair Hill, where we did it the, the, last, uh, the last time, it had a little, it was a, on the side of a gentle hill. So uh, do the cones course at a, at a trot, a working trot. It's not a speed course. Uh, it's showing that you have control and you know where you're going. And if you happen to hit a cone, that's okay too. You know, it's the main thing is having control of the of the horse. And I went over the uh, the road evaluation already. And what you know, while we're driving, um, I might you know ask you some you know have a conversation ask you some questions about some of the things that we'll go uh, go into later on. If you've got a mini and I, and I can't get into the cart with you, um, uh, we'll have a, a golf cart or something there and I'll, I'll follow you and, uh, you know, we just won't be able to to talk, so we'll talk back at the, back at the barn. But if I'm on the carriage with you, we'll you know, have a have a conversation while we're driving uh, and go over some other things. Next. Uh, some of the things that we'll go over is uh, different types of hay and grasses that we feed the horses. Uh, you know, why we feed certain types of hay to certain types of horses, depending on the work that they're doing and uh, the their their breeds, uh, how to determine if hay is 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 spoiled or bad. What can happen if you fit if you feed spoiled hay? Uh, how do you safely store hay? Uh, how much hay should a horse eat? You know, in a day. And these are just uh, basic terms. Uh, you don't have to be a nutritionist or a veterinarian. Just you know, know. Uh, some grasses that are available, you know, grasses and hays that are available in your area. Um, and, uh, you know, why, why we might feed alfalfa to what type of horse and grass hay uh, to another type uh, and that sort of thing, all general terms. <clears throat> we'll talk about hanging a hay net or a hay rack. You know, what are the dangers of having the net too low? What are the dangers of having it too high? Uh, what type of netting should be used uh, in the hay net? 
what type of knot should you use to attach it? Um, what are the dangers of a hay rack and where should it be in the horse's stall? <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, where should it be hung in relation to the horse's nose? Because that, that's how we determine where a hay rack or a, or a hay net should be. If you've got a mini, it's going to be in a different position than if you've got a Frisian. Um, and some horses carry their heads naturally high with an arch neck and others like a quarter horse have a, you know, carry their heads lower. So, uh, you know, we, we'll, dis we'll discuss that for different kinds of horses. Same thing with, we'll talk about a few different types of grains and concentrated feeds that we use for our horses. Again, you don't have to be a nutritionist. We'll keep it general. Um, uh, go into, you know, how to store grains safely to keep vermin away from it. Um, dangers in overfeeding grains and concentrates of a horse ate too much, what can happen. Uh, the importance of of clean water for horses, uh, how to check a horse for dehydration and the signs of it. And, um, you know, where the safely hang buckets and things like that. Again, all general for level one, doesn't have to be really complicated. We'll ask some questions about different types of bedding um you know different parts of the country they use different types of bedding uh in your area uh probably the two most common are straw and uh and shavings and, and um we'll talk about the stable aisle uh you know how it how it uh, should be configured should it be cluttered um safe lighting and uh, the use of extension cords and safe, <coughs> safe outlets in the stable, um, different types of cross ties and flooring and the tools that are needed for different types of bedding. And um, then that, that, that's how we would you know, go through the, uh, the evaluation. And uh, so uh, I tried not to give a whole lot of answers. That's what you, that's the idea of going through the, if anybody's got any questions, I'll try and answer them. Or, um, and that the whole thing takes about, if all goes well, go, takes about between an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I like to leave an hour and a half because, Sometimes it, it goes a little longer and uh, we're not going to be rushed. And, um, you know, we try to be uh, encouraging and accommodating to the, to the candidates. Um, in, the, in the syllabus, in, um, uh, let me see, uh, unit three element, 3.2 says lead a horse in hand using an open bridle um, for the sake of time usually when you're just taking your horse out of the stall in the halter that's good enough for me to see how you handle the horse uh, you know when I can see the way you're going to put the driving bridle on and everything it just saves a little time uh, rather than put a put an open bridle on, take it off, put the halter on again, and then put the driving bridle. Uh, that's just something that's in there. But I can see the way you're going to handle your horse, the, the, the way, you know, the way you're going to take it out of the stall or, or, you know, whatever. So you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, and I may or may not cover all of those things, but uh, we'll try and cover as many of them. And uh, that's how the evaluation is going to go. Anybody got any questions? 
Um, so I don't know if you could hear me. My name is Isabel. I'm, I'm actually with the um, Central. Um, I'm over here in Jackson, uh, New Jersey. In any event, uh, what I was wondering, is there a specific study guide? Because I know you guys have an outline, but not a specific study guide, I don't think. Is there a <laughs> specific study guide? When you, when you get your uh, your syllabus, I don't know if you have one yet, in, in the syllabus is a listing of books and resources, um, you know, for level one, level two, and level three. Um, try and, you know, over over your study periods that, that you guys are going to have together, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I think, I think uh, Brandywine uh, has got most of these books in their library and videos. And over your study periods, you'll be going over most of it. So uh, like I said, you don't have to be a harness maker. You don't have to be a, a nutritionist or a farrier. We keep things very general in level one. So uh, once you get that, once you get the syllabus and look at that uh, that uh, study guide, there's not one particular book that's going to tell you everything. <coughs> Excuse me. But, uh, was that Jerry? It's Tracy. Um, Isabel, to answer further on that question, I'm sorry, Jerry, that you're have this cough i apologize for interrupting you um there is a list of books and information in the back of the syllabus if you have not received it yet and you've not um told debbie that you want to be with our program in the actual syllabus for those of you that are on the call um if you're a caa member you get a discount on the syllabus if you work with us you get a, a lot more um, than that, but if you wish to go it on your own, that's fine too. And the CAA has a lot of things to offer the individual person that wishes to try this on their own. There are um, a list of books that are recommended in the back of the syllabus that you can go on to Google Books, and you can, many of them are available. And for everybody that's in the program, you can also go on to Google Books. And there are many available resources on Google Books and you can read individual chapters if you feel like you need to brush up on different things. Um, if you know everything about feed, you're not gonna wanna know about that. If you forget everything about a harness, you may wanna go to that video and or books that are um, included on those websites. And you can also order at a discount with your CAA membership, um, specific books that are on the CAA membership and what um, Debbie has done a wonderful job of doing is putting together our syllabus with some charts and some paperwork and um, a wonderful book um, that'll get everybody involved with um, Tom Ryder with on the box seat edition number. I think it's two or three at this point. So I hope that answers your question further, Isabel. Sorry, Jerry, to. Oh, that's all right. Great. Did that answer your question, Isabel? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I hear a lot of crickets out there. I guess I did a good job going over it with the slides. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. This is Margaret. I have a, a quick question. You mentioned that when we do the driving portion of the evaluation, that if we have a mini, you'll follow in a golf cart or a vehicle. Otherwise, um, I think you said that you typically get in the carriage with us. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if I can get in the carriage with you, if you've got a you know, an appropriate carriage and appropriate size. Um, I, you know, I, I'd like to drive in the carriage with you because then we can continue our conversation. And, um, uh, you know, it, it just goes a lot easier and quicker. But, uh, you know, what I found, some people have very small 
miniatures, you know, or VSDs, and I'm not a miniature myself. <laughs> and uh, so if, if, you know, if it's, if it's not appropriate for me to get in the carriage, then I'll follow along in, in, in a golf cart. And uh, that's good. Okay. And some, okay, you know, sounds good. Yeah. and some miniature carriages only have a seat for the driver, so then there's no place for for me to go either. Right. I and this is Alex Hers. I I had a question about the order that uh, you're harnessing up, where you put the reins on or through the the turrets, and then you put it up on the back band, and before you put the bridle on, if you have the horse tied uh you know with a halter or something could you put the bridle on with the uh with the halter around the neck uh and then put the the reins on after the bridle's already on the horse or is that a bad order for some reason well i i like to have the reins already on the harness so that when we're you know taking the uh taking the halter off and putting the bridle on, uh, it just saves some time. Because if you put the bridle on and um, you don't have any reins attached to the bit, and if, you, if you've if you got the, the halter or a neck collar around and you're on cross ties, well, then the horse isn't gonna go anywhere. But if you're working with an assistant, uh, and the horse were to move uh, or something frightened it, you really don't have any way to get get a hold of the horse. By, sure. So by sure. having the reins on, the harness are ready, then you're already ready to just, you know, pull, pull them out of the neck turrets and attach them to the bit. And then it, it's just being efficient. Okay. I'm just... I'm just going by the order in which I usually go with the horse tied and things like that, but uh, yeah. it's good. Okay. Yeah, that it, it's just, uh, you, we don't want to rush doing things because that's how you make mistakes. But if you teach yourself to be efficient and go one step after another and always do it in the same process, then it, it just goes so much faster and so much safer. Sure, thanks. <laughs> Anything else? I have a question. Yeah. Um, I don't have the syllabus in front of me, but I do recall reading something about, I think in the barn area, something about safety clothing and what would you need? And I'm thinking besides a hard hat and boots that cover your ankles, what were you thinking? Because I think it referred to like a groom versus a driver or something like that. Well, uh, I have a faulty memory. <laughs> yeah, they, they, in, in level one, it's not nothing specific about, uh, you know, about clothing. Uh, I'll you you that I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't mention it uh, in the presentation. Um, if if you want to drive with a driving apron, that's fine. If you don't want to drive with an apron, that's fine too. But I will ask you the purpose of the apron and why we use them, and um, you know appropriate footwear. Do you want to? Do you want to? be in the barn and, and flip-flops and be around your horse, you know, is that a safe thing to do? But there's not a specific, I'm looking at the uh, level one syllabus right now, and there's nothing specific about, uh, you know, about clothing. I think you might have looked at a level two or level three syllabus, and I think there's no. I don't have those syllabuses. There is yeah. some part of it, uh, it, it in the barn thing, something about, I don't know, maybe somehow, uh, I don't know where it was, but it was in the barn section. And I yeah. was just trying to figure out what else you would you possibly want, like a raincoat or what? But um, anyway, 
you've answered that. Okay. Yeah, no, you, 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 know, you, you definitely want to have gloves and uh, uh, gloves and appropriate footwear. And I'll ask you what the purpose of a driving apron is. And it's your option if you want to, uh, you know, want to want to wear one or not. And if you if you have one to show, that's fine. If you don't have one, I just want to know what the reason for the apron is. Okay. okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anything else? I, I did have one more question. I don't want to hog. This is Alex again, but um, for putting uh, the shafts in the tugs. Um, so, you know, obviously you can't be on both sides of the horse at once as one person, right? So uh, when I'm when I'm usually putting them on, I usually have uh, my assistant or an assistant on the on the other side helping to make sure the tug goes through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that okay, or does that oh, person yeah. need to stay at no, the head of, of the board? Of course, course yeah. it is. Sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, that that's what your assistant is is there for, to assist. Okay. I just wasn't yeah. sure how you balance that assistance with getting the shaft through the tug on the other side with yeah, the, no, that, making that, sure they're heading fine. the horse at the same time. That's fine for the assistant to you know to guide it through the uh, you know through the the shaft loop. Or okay. the tug. Great. Yeah. No, that's fine to do that. And you know, it during the evaluation, I would, uh, you know, I, I want everybody to have an assistant with them. Now, uh, any anybody, you can have an, anybody be your assistant, but if they're going to be doing their own evaluation they can't assist you until they've done this first you understand that because <laughs> otherwise they'd be listening in on everything so uh let, let's say you have a husband and wife and you, you're gonna gonna be assisting each other well the first the first candidate can't have their partner um, be their assistant on, if they're going to if they're going to take an evaluation later on in the day or the next day. Do you understand that logic? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, but other other than that, you know, the assistant can be anyone you know that 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 you deem uh, appropriate. Uh, you know, of course, we don't want a five year old being your assistant. <laughs> Or some, you know, somebody who can actually assist. So that that's an important factor when you when you're partnering up with uh, with each other. That if uh, you know if you if you're going to be doing an evaluation yourself, you can't assist anybody until you've already done yours. Because that would be like sitting in on on uh, on the evaluation. <clears throat> Can I ask a question for Debbie? Yeah, sure. Hi, um, this is Diane Vickery. I won't have anybody coming with me, so I will need a, an assistant. Will you be able to? Um, I'm sure maybe some other people are in the same boat. Be able to schedule assistance so that people aren't trying to help each other in <laughs> that mess? Um, you know what, what, when you fill out your application, maybe if you just make a note on there, then I can keep track of anybody who's going to need an assistant and we can try to arrange for that. Okay, that sounds yeah. good. Yeah, right. just make a note somewhere so I'll be able to keep track of it. All right, thank you. Sure. You know, an, another thing that, uh, you know, in that vein, uh, if there's if there's going to be any people that are auditing uh, and not taking an evaluation, if they're competent enough to be an assistant, 
uh, you know, that's fine for them to to help uh, and you know they can listen in and that's fine as long as they're not going to be evaluated at, you know later on in the process yeah jerry thank you for mentioning that because i was just going to say for those people um that have friends or have not fully committed yet if you would like to volunteer to be at the evaluation day and be a wingman for one of these people um like diane that's looking for for some assistance it would be really helpful for you to be there for both you and for her and everybody learns from everybody else so this is what this whole program is really about is to help each other learn more and be more efficient so if you have anybody that you know that's not on the call tonight that may want to be there on evaluation day and volunteer to be um, an assistant that would be wonderful as well yeah it's a great learning experience you know if you if you feel like you're not ready for it yet uh you know if you if you want to come in and assist somebody uh that's a great way to to learn okay debbie uh your recording is this is, is that correct and yes we can pull this up later yes i was going to mention that again at the end because i know some people joined late so this every actually every session we have all the study group sessions plus the first session that Jerry did um, about a month ago and this one are being recorded and will be available as a link to YouTube. And I'll be doing an e-lines blast out with those links so that you can get right to them. And are the slides available in addition to the video? Um, yeah, Jerry, I don't know. That's up to you if you want me to make the slides. Yeah, okay. yeah that, that's fine. You, you can okay. have the whole presentation, yeah. Okay, then I'll um, I'll also provide the link to those. Yeah. I have one more question, Jerry. What do you think about ground driving from when you put on the harness and you get the reins attached to the bridle and ground driving from where you put the harness on over to where the cart is waiting? I'd rather that the horse be led rather than ground driven. Okay. I think it's just a safer way to do it. And that, that also shows me, you know, how you handle the horse. There's a question in the chat about a cost to attend these study group sessions. I think we have like six of them or so. One of them is gonna be on site in the near the end of June at Fairhill, that's the one that'll demonstrate the road driving part of the test. And um, there's no cost. So if you're not gonna take the evaluation, you can attend all the study groups, including the on-site one in June, and there's no cost to you at all. However, again, it's a great opportunity if you don't if you're not going to do the entire course. So please come and join us for everything. And it might be a really awesome opportunity for you to come and be you know, a header or an assistant for someone who's taking the evaluation because you've learned all the lessons, you wanna see what's happening, you wanna hear the questions. And this is here as an educational process for everybody. So it'd be great if you would volunteer to come down and help. Um, someone on a given day, and we can make that available to you on who's going to be evaluated on what day if you want to partner up with somebody. And we'll have times available that you might be able to come, and um, that would be really helpful. So if you can volunteer to do that for some of these people that don't have assistance, that would be terrific for both you and um, the person that's getting evaluated. Volunteers are the backbone of every organization, and without Absolutely. volunteers, it's very difficult to do any of these things. Even if you can come and help for an hour or two, that's a great help. Yes, it is.
Does anybody have any other questions for Jerry at this time or for Debbie, who's doing an amazing job pulling this whole thing together? Any other questions or concerns um, were available to you? Debbie has made her avail her information available to everybody here. And um, for those of you that have signed up, we have um, an amazing opportunity to work with Jerry. And um, thank you, Jerry. And Debbie, do you want to conclude everything tonight or what do you want to do here? Yeah, so um, I guess the only other thing I will say, there is a schedule of dates for all the study group sessions. We've finalized the dates and the people who will be leading those study groups. So um, if you don't have that info and you need it, I can get it to you. It was published in the April newsletter. So if you can get on our website and you can download the newsletter from the homepage there, if you're not a Brandywine member and you didn't get the e-blast. Um, you can ju just take a look at the um, the page in the newsletter that has the schedule. And the, these, the online study groups will be using this same Zoom link that you used tonight. I think that's, that's everything I can think of to update everybody on. We had a great group tonight, um, up to 27 people at, at the peak. I want to commend the Brandywine Valley Driving Club for putting this all together because um, uh, I had asked at the beginning, I'm sharing this with the, with the rest of the CAA and the evaluators because this is a wonderful template to really encourage people to do it and get them prepared for it. Um, and it, it's... I, I know the incredible amount of work you're doing and it's really fantastic that you're that, that you're doing it and you're getting such a you know such a good response to it that's why I don't want to disappoint anybody but we'll just when, when September comes we'll just have to see how it shakes out yeah <coughs> But even if you don't do the evaluation, it's a great learning experience. It's going oh, to cover, yes. we're going to cover every topic that's, that is covered in the evaluation in the study groups. So it's a great learning experience. Appreciate your enthusiasm. All right. Well, I'll bid everyone good night then. Thanks right, again. Thank, for you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.